<laughs> this is actually a great introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Cameron and, and Professor Joseph, having in mind how important is the vaccination and the immunization of uh, the population at this moment and how important is COVID-19 for uh, the politics and geopolitics at this moment. And uh, despite that fact, uh, and having in mind also taking into account how important COVID-19 is, we should focus also on other aspects of American foreign policy, and we should take into account that America, the United States are still probably the most influential foreign actor in this region. And considering uh, these issues, I would like to wish you all warm welcome to the online discussion, US foreign policy, a new chapter. Uh, and uh, which is organized by the Belgrade Center for Security Policy and the Faculty of Political Science, University of Belgrade. So uh, given the current geopolitical situation and the complexity of uh, challenges, Challenges which are facing both Serbia and the United States and Western Balkans in generally speaking. I think that we will have a fruitful discussion today and that we have a lot of questions which we should uh, in depth discuss. And uh, before I begin with the introduction and before I start with introducing our uh, distinguished panelists, I would like to uh, yield the floor to the distinguished Dean uh, Dragan Rasimic, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Political Science and uh, as well a director of the Center for for the U.S. studies at the Faculty of Political Science and distinguished professor of international relations at Faculty of Political Science, Dean Simic, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Dr. Kristic. Really distinguished panelists, uh, dear participants, friends. Really, I'm very pleased by having this opportunity today to welcome, warm welcome all of you on this discussion under the title A Real Say on Serbian Relations and this special uh, stress on, uh, on the changes of U.S. foreign security policy after the elections last year in the United States. Uh, well, and needless to say how important this subject is, not only for Serbia and the regional Western Balkans, but for the, for the world. Uh, there are great expectations about the ch possible changes in U.S. foreign security policy. And of course, there is a strong need, not among pundits, academicians, uh, professors, but among uh, broader public opinion, uh, to know, to, to explore, to investigate uh, present situation in the world order, present situation in, in, in the relations between the great powers and the future of, of many questions. Actually, uh, plenty of questions uh, have been opened last year by, by the uh, presidential victory of uh, Mr. Biden in the United States. Uh, first, I'd like to, say, to tell you that uh, uh, First, I'd like really to, by name, to greet and to welcome uh, Mr. Cameron Mando and allow me to, to be and to say something in person. I'm very happy and delighted to see him again. Uh, unfortunately, not alive here in this center. Uh, we had honor. Uh, it was, I think, 13 years ago that we were very happy to host him in this center for the study of the United States of America. And he did a lot for this center and for the cooperation uh, I mean, in the field of education between our two countries. And I take the opportunity to express my sincere gratitude for all he has done uh, at that time. And after that, uh, I think four years ago, we had Professor Fukuyama, thanks to East West Institute and, and assistance of, of Mr. Mantra. Uh, welcome, welcome, uh, Your Excellency, again and back to Serbia and to this center. And of course, we had the honor as well to host Professor Edward P. Joseph, who is a lecturer of John Hopkins University. And we enjoyed last time, it was two years ago, as far as I remember, that we enjoyed an excellent lecture uh, on a very wide uh, and provocative topic concerning relations between Pristina and Belgrade. As well, we uh, have panelist, Mr. Igor Bandovic, who is director of Belgrade Center for Security Policy. This project, a real say on Serbian American relations, is going on by organized, by two organized organizers. Uh, actually, first one is uh, Belgrade Center for Security Policy, and I really say thank you very much, Mr. Bandovic and our friends from from this center for enabling this to happen. And uh, second organizer uh, host is this faculty and Center for the Studies of United States of America. Everything is is possible thanks to the kind donation of uh, the Embassy of the United States of America. And as many times uh, 
I take this opportunity again to say that thanks a lot for supporting so many actions, interesting actions, which could be very useful and is useful uh, for, and, uh, for the sake of better understanding between the two countries. And for the young people, especially students, uh, I hope that among these 52 participants, as far as you can see on the screen, uh, Mitzi will, will tell us the, the, the exact number of, of participants on this panel discussion. Uh, among most of them, I suppose, are students, and it is very exciting for me that we have so many young people who, want, who are interested in, in, a, in an ongoing, ongoing uh, processes in international relations. Do we have again, by the victory of Mr. Biden, as used to say some people in the United States, in Europe, in our country, predictability, global leadership, multilateralism, cooperation, uh, do we have enough reason to be so optimistic or not? Uh, Mr. President Biden already has taken some steps which, has, which, which is encourageable for world cooperation and for stability. But uh, of course, remains to be seen many uh, processes in the future because the situation is not the same as uh, Mr. Manter uh, put it a few minutes ago on our discussions before we, we, we join uh, with our students. So I'm not going, this is not my subject for discussion. I am not panelists and I'm paid for that actually. So I'm going to stop right here, not to take our valuable time, uh, the very end, really, I'd like one more time to express our gratitude for, to U.S. Embassy for this project and to our friends uh, from Belgrade Center for Security Policy for this very good cooperation. Uh, we are at the Faculty of Political Sciences, University of very real honored to have again in this discussion uh, such important, distinguished panelists, panelists as is His Excellency Kamara Manter, Professor Edward Joseph, Mr. Igor Bandovich, and of course, uh, so good, very good moderator as Dr. Krstic really is. I'm so glad here. Thank you very much and uh, looking forward to hear discussion. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished Dean Simic. And uh, I will just like to remind you, as, as Dr. Simic said, um, that this discussion is a part of the bigger project, which is uh, supported by US Embassy in Belgrade, and which actually aims to raise awareness about the nature of uh, Serbian-American relations and the importance of our country's strategic interests. And uh, this is just one of the activities uh, in the scope of uh, these projects, as I suppose that all of you know. So we already had a um, couple of discussions and uh, there was all, also one competition for the best essay. So this project is broader than this discussion. Uh, however, this is one of the most important discussions which is part of this project. And in this discussion, we will try to focus on uh, what will be the US foreign policy under uh, Biden's administration. And in particular, how will the Biden's administration policy affect the Western Balkans? And I think that we have amazing uh, panelists today who can help us to get the answer on this question and uh, I will just briefly introduce them since their biographies are uh, really huge and they all have a lot of achievements but I will try to digest them and just briefly to present them so I will begin with Ambassador Cameron Mar Manter uh, who is a diplomat academic and executive um, who currently works as a global consultant he was a president and the CEO of the East West Institute in New York from 2015 to 2019. Uh, and he currently uh, works, uh, he's affiliated with Agora Strategies in, in Munich and a project associates in London. And uh, also he serves on a number of corporate and nonprofit boards. Uh, he received a PhD from uh, SAIS, Johns Hopkins. Um, and uh, besides that, um, he served as the US ambassador to Serbia 
from 2007 to 2009 while he was in the U.S. Foreign Service and also in Pakistan from 2010 to 2012, which means that he served in Serbia in the time when um, Kosovo uh, self-declared uh, its recognition and in Pakistan in the time when uh, Osama bin Laden was killed, uh, which actually means that he was handling some of the most critical situations in the U.S. foreign policy in relation with these, with these countries and that he has a huge experience in crisis uh, management as a diplomat. Um, our second speaker is Professor Edward uh, P. Joseph, and uh, he's a foreign policy specialist, writer, and a lecturer, as well as a field practitioner who uh, has served in, well, some of the toughest locations in the world and the most uh, the locations with the biggest crisis in the last couple of decades. Um, some of them are Bosnia, Croatia, uh, Kosovo, Macedonia, well, as well as uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, and uh, Haiti. And uh, he currently lectures at the SAIS, uh, at the Johns Hopkins University, Considering his uh, huge um, experience in the practice, he is one of the best lecturers at that school, and I hope that he will give you answers on some of the questions, considering uh, his um, his experience that he will be able to give his uh, his view on the current issues and, of course, to answer the questions from our audience. And our third lecturer is Igor Bandovic. Uh, Igor Bandovic is a lawyer from Belgrade and uh, he is currently the president of the director of the Belgrade Center for Security Policy, in which he used to work from 2002 to 2006, firstly, as a researcher. Uh, besides that, he has founded uh, in 1997, his own NGO, Libergraf, and afterwards he worked for International Organizations for Migration and uh, UNDP in uh, Belgrade. Uh, and uh, he's currently, as I have said, the director of Belgrade Center of Security uh, Policy, which is one of the leading um, CSOs in Serbia in the field of uh, security policy and uh, the rule of law. Um, I don't want to bother you anymore with the introduction. I would like to start with the questions for our panelists and uh, considering that the broadest topic of our today's discussion is the general U.S. policy under Biden's administration. I would uh, like to firstly kindly ask Ambassador Manter to um, share with us his opinion about what are the U.S. foreign policy priorities under Biden's administration. Ambassador Manter, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks to the University of Belgrade and to BS, the BCSP and to all of you taking part. I notice we have some high level people here. I even hope, uh, I believe that we have Ambassador Godfrey on the line. So I'd better be careful what I say because it better be right. Um, I will try to be direct and try to be uh, straightforward about, um, about uh, this interpretation. The Biden administration has a global focus. Now this is kind of a, a, a truism, but it means that its focus is looking at problems that are worldwide, and I'll get into those specifically, but looming over them is China. So when you say, what is the priority of the US government in terms of foreign policy, is probably China and the, the problems and the issues that deal with China. The means by which this group will deal with it is by renewing the strength of America's multilateral relationships, that is building its alliances. As you know, this was not a priority for President Trump. And this is something that in terms of creating stability and creating predictability, I think is a quite, um, uh, just a, a, quite, a, quite a switch. Now, when you think of switch though, is it a switch that's going back to the past? Is it an attempt to go back to the 1990s? When you look at the people who uh, Biden has chosen as his Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, uh, as his Deputy Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman, as his uh, political undersecretary, Toya Newland, these are all people I worked with in the 1990s. So the danger is, and some have accused this new administration of being restoring an old mindset. Now they are consciously saying they are not trying to do that, but I think it is something that this group has to watch out for because as we know, the world has changed dramatically. Well, look at China. The fact that they are focused on China is important. But again, let's talk about the means by which they do this. It's through alliances. And when they look at Europe, 
They look primarily through the restructuring of alliances. Europe is not the object of American policy. Europe will be the partner in American policy. At least that's what I think this administration wants to do. They want to do it by working with the big institutions like NATO and the European Union. And they will probably focus more than the previous administration did on the big allies, the Germans, the French. And even though Britain is only questionably European, also the Brits. I don't, I, I, I will, you know, you can draw your conclusions whether that's good for the Balkans or not. But I do believe that's what they'll do. When he sits down, when Tony Blinken sits down with Ursula von der Leyen, what they have said is that there are four priorities that they're working on. And those four priorities are the pandemic, climate change, trade, and digital governance. Now, you don't hear the word Balkans in there. You don't hear Russia. You don't hear a lot about NATO. You don't hear a lot about traditional security. And I would say that this group is in the process of defining security a little differently. They're looking at the pandemic. They're looking about instability. They're looking about how global change could lead to things like migration. They're thinking about the pandemic and how countries can have a healthy world economy, how they can work about making globalism less of a problematic problem than it's been in the, in the past. So there will be a lot of focus on Brussels, a lot of focus on Berlin, trying to come up with multilateral solutions to issues. What does that mean then if you're in the Balkans or where I live in Prague in the Central and Eastern Europe? If you're on the periphery of Europe, you have to think about, you're not going to have a Grinnell anymore. You're not gonna have some guy who comes in and sharpshoots problems in the East. He's not going to have, I would say you can expect, it would be, it would surprise me if we saw a new American push to focus exclusively on Kosovo, Serbia. Rather, I think what the Americans will do is they will try to integrate these other countries, these peripheral countries of Europe, into the broad themes that they worry about. What is the interest of Balkan countries in climate change? What is the interest, what is the contribution of the Baltic countries on the pandemic? What are the issues that they care about when it comes to trade and, and economic development? So there's a kind of reversal that I think may take place, which is that rather than saying, what is our Balkan policy? I think what the Americans will do is say, in which ways can the Balkans contribute to the broader global issues that we all have to deal with? It's anyone's guess whether this is an effective policy, but I think it is a mindset, and I base this on conversations I've had with fairly senior people, a mindset where you're trying to say, the Balkans, Central Europeans, other people, if you want to be uh, part of the European American transatlantic issue, participate with us in this, come up with solutions with us, rather than saying the Balkans is a problem. Now, events have a habit of getting in the way of these grand designs. We all think, you know, what the hell is happening in Turkey, right? What the hell is happening in the Eastern Mediterranean? What about Ukraine? You know, what about the potential for things like the Three Seas Initiative? What about the future of NATO and the future of new kinds of warfare? There can be all kinds of events that get in the way of big things. And I would say that this is one of the, one of the elements that uh, analysts should keep an eye on. What are the things that will get in the way of achieving this rebuilding of the alliances to get the Europe, and I think by extension, expanded Europe, Europe beyond the borders of, of the European Union and NATO, to get them to try to work together in an alliance of friends and like-minded people on these big conceptual issues. But you and I know that every once in a while, problems come up. There can be a problem in the Balkans. There can be a problem uh, in the Mediterranean. There can be a problem in the Donbass or in the Crimea. And if that happens, uh, you know, very often events take the American, uh, they, they take these broad ideas and steer them away from where they go. So I don't want to be much longer than that because we have a lot to talk about and I want to leave room for questions. But once again, I would emphasize overwhelmingly the focus at this point on multilateralism and for the Balkans, how do they fit in to the multilateral vision that Biden brings?
Okay, I, I can't hear I'm you. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I apologize. So thank you very much uh, for this great first answer and for the general introduction to our today's topic. And um, considering that we will focus uh, in more in details to the US policy towards the Balkans, which is the topic which you uh, already discussed in your first answer, I would uh, like to answer uh, the Professor Joseph, considering that uh, he's uh, also an expert in uh, the West Western Balkan politics and the US policy towards the region uh, to offer and to share with us his view about the US policy towards uh, the Western Balkans under Biden administration uh, with a special emphasis on the policy towards uh, Serbia. Professor Joseph, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Milan. Samo krako na srpskom, želim vas pozdraviti. Mene je zaista čast što ste mene pozvali na ovom event i što sam na ovom panelu zajedno sa ovim uglednim stručnjacima, kao i vi, gospodin dr. Šimić, ambasador Munter, Igor Bandović i zaista meni drago što sam ovdje danas, Mila. Let me begin, puno hvala. Let me begin where ambasador Munter left off. Uh, which is um, the point, uh, crucial point that he made, which is that the perception that we uh, focus on China and focus on Balkans in terms of how the region can uh, participate in solutions. And so when we come to Biden administration foreign policy, uh, Ambassador Munter has really helped us focus and put this in the proper context. What's the challenge? The challenge is we're turning to a region, saying to a region, how can you help us participate in solutions to counter our threats and those global threats, including the threat from Russia and China, when Russia and China are working exactly in that region to prevent uh, that type of cooperative effort to work on those solutions and to stabilize that region. And by contrast, see the Balkans as precisely the platform to do what Ambassador Munter said is our primary uh, problem, which is confronting the threat, both from China and I would add, and I believe in, in my view, equal threat, is Russia, because Russia poses a much more immediate and direct threat to American national security. China's uh, threat is uh, uh, equally serious, but in different in some respects. But we see with our own elections, with our cybersecurity, that we in the United States face a direct security threat from Russia. So when we turn to the Balkans and we say, how can you guys participate with us? That's great in principle uh, and participate with us in all these challenges, but we have two adversaries who are working exactly in that region, precisely in that region, not just to keep that region a mess, but to use that region as a platform to make it harder for us to cooperate with our allies to deal with their threats. So we have a strategic problem in the Balkans. And so when we come and then when we turn now from Ambassador Munter's a broader picture to the specifics of, well, what can you do, we do and what can we do with our allies? We have a problem. We have a particular problem, not just because Russia and China are active, but Russia and China have an active partner in the region. And that partner is Serbia. And we there are outstanding issues uh, with Serbia um, that we have, most notably Kosovo. So, uh, we can turn to the region and we can say, be a partner and help us, but we have active opponents preventing that. And so that's the challenge for the Biden administration foreign policy, exactly as Ambassador Mantra said, uh, totally agree. Working in concert with, um, uh, with our uh, allies and partners. So how, so how do we do that? How is the Biden administration going to accomplish and meet this challenge? That's, the, that's really the question. And 
what I would do here is I'd, uh, take a few minutes to just sketch out the, the view is, um, first of all, let's put the region in context and say that uh, as we're speaking here in March, um, and March has in history been known as a challenging month, going back to the Ides of March, there's many there's events, including with Serbia that occurred in March that were very difficult. March is when the pandemic began. And I would think this March, I'm hoping, marks the low point in EU credibility in the region. Because uh, in my view, you have uh, a complete contrast between a uh, languishing, laggard, failing EU approach to the region matched with what appears to be a very vibrant and successful Chinese approach. And again, as Ambassador Munter pointed out, our number one uh, uh, adversary and concern. So the, this march marks, in my view, a low point in that. Not a low point for citizens because citizens should be vaccinated and that's great that they're being vaccinated, but a low point in terms of uh, the credibility of the overall strategy. So that's number one. Number two is when we uh, come to the Biden administration, let's not forget about the factor of time. The administration's just been in office for a couple of months, less so for some of the senior officials, who of course had to be appointed. And uh, so there's still uh, time to, and needed to go through and define how it will um, uh, depart and how it will achieve its goals. So there's still a time factor here uh, that's uh, yet to be defined completely. Nonetheless, uh, the administration has moved swiftly to do what I believe is um, among its key points, which is to distinguish itself from the Trump administration. We have to remember the nature of the election in the US, that these were not just some differences on policy, taxation, and things like this. These were two fundamentally different views about our own domestic order and global order. So the administration um, is, uh, has moved very quickly to define itself away from that. But that doesn't mean, it, uh, one of the ways, ironically, that they're gonna dis have already distinguished themselves is not acting like Trump to, to uh, make foreign policy in many ways about doing whatever Obama did, we're gonna do the opposite. So they've already changed that from Trump. They're not gonna do that just because Trump did it, we're not gonna do that. No, instead, it's gonna be a foreign policy based on principles, values, and relevance, of course, to US national security interests, which means domestic security. This is the so-called uh, Sullivan Doctrine. So there's, a, there's an element of that and as Ambassador Munter sketched out uh, correctly here, it's a, a foundational principle is working with our allies. So uh, what does that mean? And me, again, it, some of this is yet to be defined. Uh, we see uh, early steps by the administration to in some ways, quite significant steps and unusual steps for an administration so soon in its foreign policy to define its foundations, both with respect to uh, its work with its allies and in the Balkans. And uh, so already in just these two months, we see two key signals that the administration has sent. Uh, let's, the first is with the most powerful country in uh, the European Union, and that's Germany. And the administration has uh, sent a very strong signal about Russia on Nord Stream. And, and, I, and Secretary Blinken uh, issued very strong, repeated signal about sanctions and about saying this is a geopolitical event. Uh, and uh, this is a fundamental difference in the way we perceive this uh, event, this project from Germany. But the US has sent a signal again to a stalwart ally and friend and most powerful uh, uh, country in the EU. Now, how about in the Balkans? Uh, it has not neglected the Balkans, even in the early days. Uh, we see with the letter from President Biden 
to President Vucic congratulating Serbia on its national day, that in that greeting, uh, the president took the, the step to uh, uh, mention Kosovo, for, uh, grounded in, of course, friendship, the friendship between uh, Serbia and the United States, between the American people and the Serbian people, but grounded in there, the need to do two things, make necessary reforms and to recognize normalization with Kosovo uh, with the foundation of mutual recognition. So that was already stated very early in administration in February. As Secretary Blinken followed this up uh, in a uh, greeting to um, Kosovo, reiterating that and noting, of course, the point as in any difficult issue, compromise. So the question will be on Kosovo, what is the nature of that compromise? But those are two signals that, that it, in my view, uh, that the administration is uh, values-based and principles-based and is not uh, reluctant about voicing that. So uh, those are two uh, quite significant elements. Uh, then we come, okay, how is that going to be worked out? Now, the, that is what's yet to be defined. And where we see uh, some need for ambiguity is we see in some of the messaging uh, from the State Department, even before the after the election, but before the administration took office, of a different tone, which is rather than a overarching message of change from what Trump represented, of course, keeping anything that made sense that they did, not changing out of spite, but changing out of necessity, changing out of what truly makes America a great country. Uh, that change, we see a different message that has been given occasionally, which is a message of continuity. So uh, that is where the policy has not yet been quite formulated, and nor has the um, relationship and the, the nature of that partnership with the European Union on the Balkans has, has also not been fully and finally formulated. And that's, that's the challenge. And uh, I'm not here with a, a, a precise uh, crystal ball to say, well, this is exactly how that uh, relationship and that partnership is going to be formulated. But if we look at some of the key differences between Trump and Biden, some of it becomes more clear. Uh, so Donald Trump, uh, very briefly, and Milan, jump in any time if I'm going on too long. So I had, uh, no objection to that. So, um, I didn't note that the time was. But if we look quickly, just to summarize, what was Donald Trump's approach, the Trump administration? Ambassador Munter mentioned um, Grinnell, uh, and there were other elements of here. So, uh, Trump uh, first didn't know the Balkans, not connected with it, uh, values-free uh, foreign policy, transactional, a pro-Russia orientation at the top, uh, hostile towards China, yet uh, ambivalent and positive towards Xi and other authoritarian leaders. Uh, and then with the EU, ironically, uh, contemptuous of multilateral, but in its transactional way, willing to cooperate closely, partner with the EU where it served its interest, most notably in uh, with Serbia and Kosovo on the land swap. Uh, this was not done in opposition with the EU. This was done in total support of uh, the uh, EU uh, position on this in, in total concert with that. And as Ambassador Munter men mentioned, then that broke uh, after that failed and collapsed because Germany uh, intervened, that uh, changed, and we, we then got the opposite, which was uh, unilateral US action in with a completely different principle, unconnected with really uh, the near-term resolution of the Kosovo issue and the economic normalization policy. So what do we have with Biden? I'll quickly finish here, uh, Milan. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, what do we have with Biden? You have just a, a, a enormous contrast. You have someone who comes not just with knowledge of the Balkans, but personal connection. And I would say here, emphasize that this is not a 1990s uh, connection at all, uh, even though that's the root of it. He was, let's remember, he was for eight years vice president. He's met with Alexander Vucic. He's met with the other leaders. Uh, he's spoken on, on issues. This is not 
some stuck in the 1990s thing, and I would uh, uh, disabuse uh, viewers and listeners of, of thinking about that. This is uh, someone who understands in a sophisticated way the problems of the region uh, and uh, and knows the leaders, and is and that's a huge asset because when the issues come up, they're familiar and don't need to be explained uh, to the president of the United States. And you can see the connections uh, to it between this and uh, and Russia, and is certainly aware of uh, what China is doing. And so, and in addition, let me quickly say that his Secretary of State is very unusual, um, Tony Blinken, in that he not only knows this region as well, but he and Biden go back. So this is not a Secretary of State who's, you know, Hillary Clinton coming in, um, Mike Pompeo coming in and working something out uh, of, of their relationship with the president. This is a Secretary of State who has been the foreign policy partner of Joe Biden for uh, many years. So the two are representing at once the same policy, the same global perspective, including uh, the Balkans, which Secretary Blinken also knows extremely well. And then the question, Milan, is uh, how that will play out with the issues that we confront. And we can speak about that. We can be happy to talk and uh, speak in specifics, how that plays out with Serbia, how it plays out with Kosovo, Bosnia, uh, North Macedonia, and um, uh, Montenegro as well, the, the uh, key issues there, please. Thank you very much, Professor Joseph, and I hope that we will have enough time to discuss all of those issues in details, and we will have uh, probably a lot of questions from the audience regarding the particular issues which you uh, have mentioned, and uh, therefore I will now uh, yield the floor to Mr. Bandovic, and uh, considering the general priorities of the U.S. administration, which Mr. Mantra has mentioned, as well as the tendency to distinguish from uh, Trump's administration, which will Biden's administration obviously have. Uh, what do you think that Serbia su should do in this case and what should be a Serbian approach towards the new American administration? Mr. Bandovic, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm really, really uh, happy to be in this great panel and to discuss uh, this on time. Uh, topic when it comes to the U.S.-Serbia relations as we are marking 140 years of diplomatic ties between U.S. and Serbia. Uh, to go directly to your question, Milan, I think, you know, uh, U.S. has changed and I think uh, that democratic change in U.S. Uh, has been, you know, seen and there, were, there, were, there was great interest of the whole of the world to see that dramatic change. Um, in the Balkans, uh, there was a great interest um, to see the elections and to look at the election night in US because I think many people who looked at it, uh, they thought something big is happening and uh, probably this will affect our small region. Um, what is Balkans to expect from the US? And well, that depends on really on particular countries. I think the best thing, for example, for Serbia would be also to go into democratic change if it wants to um, have principal cooperation uh, and value-based um, um, relationship with the US. I think that uh, would be uh, most natural and most desirable thing to do. Probably this will not happen, but uh, I think uh, this, uh, uh, this is something which we sh should note. As for the other parts of the region, uh, as you know, US has invested a lot over the course of the last 20 or even more years in the region, but I think this is still not secured investment. And I think having in mind that um, the other uh, big players, and this has been a US play, uh, uh, EU playground for some time, and EU was a lone player in the region. Uh, unfortunately, it 
he didn't do that much. And in the meantime, others came and fulfilled this void. Now we have a more complex picture of the region. We have Russia and we have China. Uh, EU credibility is, I think, on a very thin ice here. And this is where I see where US, the new administration and new um, uh, US approach can make a difference. This would be really, really important to do because my understanding is that um, during the course of the pandemic, especially, EU is really losing its uh, um, um, appeal here. And uh, I think uh, someone has to do something about that. And if the, as, as we heard from pre previous panelists, uh, if the e uh, US is to work uh, with the EU on multilateral uh, uh, approaches, which includes the region, they have to really um, do something about this part because otherwise the region will be, uh, will be lost. What other things we can say from, um, from perspective of um, Serbia when it comes to the new administration, a new chapter in US um, uh, foreign policy? I mean, we, we still do have baggage from the past. Um, and uh, th there are some specific issues that needs to be addressed. Um, I think Serbia, uh, well, administration and government have not resolved that successfully. One of the things is uh, case of Bitici brothers, storming of the US embassy. I think these are things that are getting in the way uh, of the US uh, Serbia relations. Uh, there is the um, well, NATO bombing, of, of course, uh, which still uh, echoes um, um, uh, troubling uh, past. But I think apart from these specific issues, what uh, would be uh, appealing for a new American administration and probably for better image of Serbia uh, in the US is that uh, Serbia embrace rule of law it should embrace um, multilateralism, it should embrace Euro-Atlantic uh, integration, it, it should lead, in my opinion, when it comes to the uh, region and other, it should lead by example where uh, Serbia probably has the biggest potential because of the, uh, because it's, it, it's the largest country in the region. And this can be probably at the end it would uh, eventually lead to better uh, partnership between the uh, Serbia and US. Unfortunately, we are far from, from that at the moment. Uh, I will just quote our president Vucic, which last year in this very March said that uh, European solidarity is dead and we only have Chinese friends. There, there were a couple of other variants of, of this um, uh, um, um, really embracing this Chinese partnership. Um, it is not uh, really for the country which uh, pretends or, or wants to be part of the EU and more, uh, you know, Western world to, to play uh, geopolitical games with, uh, uh, with China and Russia. Unfortunately, Serbia is doing so um, and it's doing so by playing each other against. And that's really unfortunate. Uh, I think it is probably, uh, this is probably visible and the signals are coming to, to Washington when it comes to this. And um, probably there is going to be a consequences because I remember, uh, uh, you know, there was a, I, I think that the struggle for democracy in US, which was in a veil, in a way, um, uh, um, uh, very problematic during the, 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 the Trump's years uh, was that there is there was a big uh, polarization in in US. There was a big uh, hatred in the air, uh, and all these things uh, we are facing exactly in Serbia nowadays. So if one can connect the dots it would be easy to understand in which way Serbia should go and um, 
you know, what, what kind of Serbia American administration should support. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bandovic. And I would uh, just uh, like to inform all of the attendees that they can uh, write their questions using the Q&A option at the Zoom uh, webinar. And uh, we will ask your questions really soon. But before we start with, we will answer your questions, sorry, really soon. But we, before we start with that, I have a, one additional round of questions, but I will just uh, kindly ask our panelists to just give brief answers on, on these questions. Uh, Mr. Manter might have a, a bit longer answer since his first round was shorter. So uh, we will start with you, Ambassador Manter, and uh, please uh, just short answer about how do you see what will be the US foreign policy, the US policy towards the dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina and the, the normalization, the, the perspective of the normalization agreement between two sides. Uh, sorry, just, just, just please, yes. Right, I'm unmuted. I'll make a couple of comments about this. It's not that there's an overarching kind of theory that I think, I think uh, Professor Joseph has made it clear that this is still a policy and, and, and a set of steps that's in the process of being developed. Let me mention a few things that, that will happen, which is, first of all, from my general belief that the focus will be on Europe as a whole, um, I think the Americans will engage, but don't expect the Americans to engage without the Europeans. And by the Europeans, I mean either with the Germans, with the EU representatives, with Mr. Lajczak, with, you know, you know, through NATO. In other words, in their effort to try to work with Europe, on all problems, not just the Western Balkans. I think you will see an effort not to grandstand, not to try to cut out the Europeans like Grinnell did, and this kind of thing. Um, so expect that the Europeans will be at the table in some way. Now, maybe the Americans lead, maybe the Europeans lead, but I don't think it's going to be without them. Secondly, uh, this administration has shown a, a fondness for uh, naming envoys, special envoys. There is, you know, a special envoy for climate. There's a special envoy for, uh, I think, you know, the Horn of Africa. Uh, I would expect there will be an envoy for the Western Balkans. I'm not sure, but I would expect there would be one. And it'll be interesting to see whether that envoy is someone who is basically, you know, someone who is kind of there to help the Europeans or there to do special deals with countries like Serbia or insisting that Serbia work with its neighbors in a certain way, in which it could be a bit, there are many different kinds of people who could emerge as this envoy, in my opinion. Um, I think that uh, there is a, there is a real, a real sad thing that happened, which is that, you know, even though I can understand why every administration wants to do things differently than another one, um, there was a, a very uh, capable man who was named to run the, the uh, Development Finance Corporation, John Jovanovic, who was in, in, at the embassy, working at the embassy in Belgrade, and who has, is no longer working there. The new administration took him out. This is a shame. Jovanovic and what the DFC stands for and these kinds of initiatives that could be focused on real problems, real problems of investment capital, looking at different kinds of industries to get different higher value added uh, 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 firms supported in places like Serbia, not just in Serbia, Kosovo as well, that this, this is what would contribute to that democratization and that opening up of what has been in many ways a stagnant society over the last 20 years. Because, you know, to get at these issues that we talk about, the questions of corruption, the questions of, of, of um, you know, democratization, uh, I think the Americans know that it, it's not enough to wave our fingers at our, 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 our Balkan friends and say, you should be democratic, you know? We know that doesn't work. What does work? Well, at least taking into account that you have a terrible brain drain problem, that there's hopelessness among young people who don't see uh, opportunities in the future. So part of what I would look at is kind of, if you, if you think about it in a certain way there, the French president Clemenceau once said, war is too important to be left to the generals. Well, as an ex-diplomat, I can say diplomacy is too important to be left to the diplomats. Right? And by this, I mean, look, you need the diplomats, but they are necessary, but not sufficient. And I think, uh, I think that our diplomats would say, the diplomats need to be helped by American businesses. They have to be helped by American civic organizations. They have to be helped by American 
um, subnational leaders like governors and senators to, to make sure that they engage at lots of levels. This is a strength of the United States. And I would hope that the United States in dealing with Kosovo and Serbia will bring to bear not just a couple of uh, negotiators who sit down over a table and argue what name they're gonna give a lake in, in north of Mitrovica, but instead really begin to talk about these things, these issues that are the, uh, the, 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 the problems preventing Serbia and Kosovo from realizing their potential, let alone the problems of a country like, like uh, Bosnia, which is in, one could argue even a bigger mess in terms of governance. So I guess what I'm looking at is keep an eye on who the envoy will be, figure out whether it will be an envoy who is just part of the overall uh, scheme to work with Europeans or whether it, what I would hope is that the envoy and the strength of the embassy, and you have a very strong embassy in Belgrade and, in, and also in Pristina and elsewhere, that they can work with other partners to strengthen this kind of social link that I think the Democrats are more likely or more inclined to do than the previous administration. Thank you very much, Ambassador Manter. And uh, I will use uh, your uh, mentioning of the DFC as a uh, starting line for the question which I have for Professor Edward Josephs, having in mind that uh, now it's a bit, uh, well, it's not really under the question mark. It seems that the DFC office in Belgrade will survive. Uh, however, there are certain rumors that it might not be as operational as we thought that it will be uh, in the first place. And um, considering that this, um, cooperate, this, this corporation was founded by the joint support of both Democrats and Republicans in the US Congress, and that it was supposed to be one of the main instruments of the US uh, influence, financial influence in this region. What do you think that will be the most important instruments for uh, the U.S. in their try, in their well struggle or effort to confront the Russian and Chinese influence in this region, which is perceived as as rising? Okay, Milan, that's. Uh... Actually, a, a hard question to answer in, in a just a very short way, because you're linking DFC to some uh, overall Russian, uh, our dealing with the Russian threat. So it's very hard to do this uh, in very briefly. Let me try it this way. Uh, let's start with our ground principles that we've talked about. Ambassador Munters mentioned, and I mentioned, that we have this foundation of partnership with, um, with the European Union. Okay. Think about the word partnership. What's involved in partnership? It's not just, oh, okay, we're partners. Everything uh, goes, we're, we're great. We agree on everything. It's not the way any partnership works. Any partnership that is successful depends on uh, mutual reciprocal obligations, expectations that are met. So, uh, uh, and, and that, that evolve and, th and that are flexible enough to meet other challenges that, that come in. That's, that's the foundation of a partnership. So if we have a partnership with the EU on the Balkans or specifically on Kosovo. Well, is it gonna work? What's the EU doing to make it work? Um, there's, again, there are issues with the foundation. The re even reason that there is the need for such a dialogue is because of divisions within the EU. So that, if, again, I won't go in to take the time to explain that, but there, there wouldn't even be a Kosovo problem if the EU had a common position uh, on the topic. Uh, Serbia would be in the EU now uh, if the EU had a common position on the topic. So partnership depends on performance. It, and, uh, and we have, okay, so this Kosovo dialogue is, uh, is handed off to the EU. It's it, what, what it will do will depend on um, its performance in that and its strategy. And here again, uh, we won't, I, I don't have time to, to talk about the, the, the strategy there, but in terms of uh, Russian influence, what's the basis for Russian influence in the Balkans? The basis for it is of course, its relationship with Serbia and in Bosnia with Republika Srpska. And what is the, what are the issues that the way it exploits this interest? by keeping these issues open. And the issue that is most open is Kosovo. And 
it is Russia with China that keeps it open. They keep it open at the Security Council with the veto on the, the UN interest. And the EU is not uh, united to stand on this. So these are linked, Milan. These issues are linked. So we cannot just say, oh, we have a, oh, we'll deal with the Europeans over here on Kosovo and the dialogue, and we'll deal over here with the threat from Russia, and we'll do a few things over here with the time. These two are sort of parallel tracks that, no, the two are one and the same. And uh, the partnership is one and the same. And the partnership uh, will survive, or not survive, it will survive, but the partnership will be successful on the way it uh, accomplishes uh, this. And uh, again, I could speak in detail about what is going on with the dialogue and the Lychak approach and the EU and US approach, but I, I won't take any more time. I hope that was short enough. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Joseph, for your uh, brief and clear answer. And uh, I will just uh, briefly ask, uh, sorry, to uh, Mr. Bandovic to give his comment about what will be the Serbian position regarding the new, U the new or the changed or adjust U.S. policy towards Belgrade and Pristina dialogue. Will Serbia as well change or adjust uh, its positions in the dialogue with Pristina regarding the possibility for the comprehensive normalization agreement considering the changes in the U.S. administration? Thank you. Thank you, Milan, for this question. I, I will try to be short so we can leave uh, some room for the questions. Um, I think that uh, it is obvious, as, uh, as others said, it is obvious that um, uh, somehow U.S. left uh, uh, this um, um, uh, part of the world and, uh, and it left it to EU to deal with this, um, uh, well, the, with the Balkans and especially with the Serbia uh, Kosovo relations. I think the problem with, with, uh, uh, with the Kosovo Serbia relations is that there are high expectations both in the US and the EU that we are to expect some kind of a agreement. I don't see agreement coming uh, anytime soon, and I'm saying this from uh, from really from the uh, for, for, I mean looking at the domestic politics, uh, especially in Serbia. Uh, so there's I mean if someone wants to solve this, uh, uh, it has to have different set of instruments and tools because I think that the tools, sticks and carrots, which were used. Uh, are totally outdated and really old fashion. So we have to have a different kind of uh, really, um, um, uh, you know, uh, tools for that. Um, also, I think that, um, and I agree with what uh, Professor Joseph said, uh, what is the leverage and really uh, uh, of Russia in, in the box and especially uh, in Serbia, but you know the problem is that uh, we we see Russian presence, but not that much. I think the full might of Russia would come. Uh, we, we would see it only if Serbia would do something which is um, uh, you know uh, totally um, opposite to what um, uh, uh, Russia wants. For example if Serbia is about to vote for the, you know, on the referendum to join the EU, then we would see probably full force of the Russian, uh, um, uh, you know, might uh, here, as we seen uh, just before the PRESPA agreement in North uh, uh, Macedonia. Uh, so, but I mean, as we don't have it now, I think it is, it is a good moment to really um, uh, to somehow to um, reinvest uh, its, uh, I mean, especially the US, to reinvest its attention to, to, to Serbia and the Balkans, because there are numerous uh, interesting things going on when it comes to that. So I don't expect uh, any further uh, or, or different US engagement. Uh, but I don't think that anything is going to be solved anytime soon, unfortunately. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bandwich. And uh, I would like to uh, repeat one more time that uh, all of the attendees, all of the people in the audience uh, can use the Q&A option to ask our distinguished panelists the questions which they want. And we have uh, one first question. Mr. Ambassador Manter already answered it, but he answered it uh, in a private answer in, in, in uh, Zoom. So I would kindly ask him to just briefly answer it um, as well here uh, for other uh, panelists and other participants so they can hear his answer. So the question is, how can U.S. foreign policy support greater U.S. business presence in Serbia and the region, since it seems that this region is not in the focus of U.S. businesses and that this could be one of the ways of countering Chinese and Russian influence. That is the question, Ambassador Manter, please. Yes, my, my, my answer is not really that earth shaking. It's that in order to, for businesses to make decisions, they have to realize that what they're investing in is something where there's a payoff. And uh, if you were to consider this as competing with the other emerging markets or what some people might even call a frontier market, you know, where you have high risk and therefore an expectation of high return, expectation of high return, you have to measure these kinds of things and figure out why is this a good deal. Uh, now, I believe that having the, de uh, the Development Finance Corporation and the idea of unleashing the idea of capital can make partners more attractive to American firms, you know, you can do this at a working level, but the overall assessment of the region, I would believe when I speak to firms is, why should I risk my money in the Balkans when I can, when I can maybe make better money somewhere in Southeast Asia? That's, that's what you're up against. You're not up against, you know, Europe versus something else. It's, it's a global world for investment from American firms, and they have to believe that somehow it pays off. There's a lot of attention that's being paid to Mr. Kurti and what he's talking about in jobs and justice and fighting corruption. If he can convince investors that he is actually fighting corruption, I think you'll see, I think you'll see a lot of uh, interest in Kosovo. But the language that comes out of Serbia at this point or the leadership of Bosnia or um, you know, other, other countries is not, is not convincing American firms yet that there is a serious effort to try to crack down on the kind of corruption. You know, the question that any American business will ask is, if I'm in a lawsuit against a Serbian firm and a Serbian court is going to make the decision, do I have a chance? And most com companies I talk to in the United States don't think they do, right? And as long, it doesn't matter whether it's true. If they don't think they do, they're not going to invest. So this is the question. How do you get those American firms? The American Chamber of Commerce, the MC, everyone else can encourage them and they should, but they will make their decision based on whether this particular emerging market makes sense for them given the risk. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Mentor. Just one additional short question regarding your answer as a follow-up. So what do you think about if um, the project of the joint single market in the region eventually occurs? So if we manage to make a uh, joint single, single market of the Western Balkans, which is currently uh, a plan which will probably uh, be implemented in the scope of the Brussels of the Berlin process inside the dialogue between the EU and the Western Balkans. Will that eventually uh, anyhow um, co contribute to the attraction of the American investors to Serbia and the region? Uh, the quick answer is yes. Anytime there's a sense that people are able to come to agreement, especially people who are famous for not coming to agreements, it shows a good will and, 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 and a, a sense that things are, are working well. So similarly, there is always a greater attraction to a larger market than a smaller market. The so-called Yugosphere that Mr. Tim Judah of The Economist refers to, uh, the Yugosphere is 20 million people. If you're a business, a 20 million uh, person market is a lot more attractive than 7 million. So um, I think, yes, it's a step in the right direction. But I think, I think once again, as long as the governments of the, and let's just look at the Serbian government, as long as the Serbian government uh, seems to American investors not to be serious about major uh, uh, issues of reform, um, it's, going to, it's going to limit the amount of time they spend investing. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Manter, for, for emphasizing the emphasizing the importance of the rule of law, uh, but as well for addressing the the Yugosphere, as Tim Judah said, or e Yugoslavia, as Timothy Less said, which is the, the, the new concept which might explain this uh, single market in the region. And uh, I think that might be one uh, important issue which we should follow and probably one issue which would have the US support in the future. And um, considering the US policy towards the region, I would uh, use the opportunity since, oh, okay, yeah, we have one additional question. I'm sorry, then I will not use this opportunity. opportunity. I will leave it for, for later if we have enough time. But we have a, a one question for Mr. Joseph. Um, and that is, what is your personal opinion on how the Republic of Serbia should position itself in uh, the relation to the, to the so-called Republic of Kosovo and how towards uh, Republika Srpska? Mr. Joseph, no. the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, it's not often I'm asked to give advice to the uh, Serbian government, but I'll uh, take this rare opportunity uh, to, to do that. Uh, it's all part of one and the same. It's one and the same choice. There's nothing, there's nothing unique about the Kosovo issue, uh, and there's nothing uh, obviously unique about Serbia's relationship with, with Bosnia. There's nothing unique about any of these things. They're all rolled into the same issue. Uh, the, the, the question is, what does Serbia want to be? That's the question. That's the question. And, um, uh, and, other, and I would say there, there have been occasionally American diplomats who put that question. Um, Hoi Yi has put that question uh, publicly uh, to um, President Vucic in Serbia. That's, that's what these boil down to. Uh, if you, it all boils down to that. If you want to be, uh, if you want to make that choice and you want to be in the West, then you resolve these issues and they are resolvable. There's nothing about the Kosovo issue that is uh, intrinsically and inherently resolvable. It is a resolvable issue. Other issues have been resolved in the Balkans that are in, in some ways even more difficult. Uh, uh, and, and there's even a current issue that in some ways that's uh, extremely difficult uh, to resolve between uh, two other countries. So that's that, my advice is uh, make the choice. The choice is clear and uh, I could explain how and, and why that, that uh, choice could be done. But I've got to quickly take an opportunity here uh, before we go, I, I want to, uh, mentioned that the point uh, Igor made was uh, exactly right about the EU credibility. And uh, there's uh, no other country where this EU credibility, uh, which influences all of this, everything we're talking about. And I mentioned with you, you March at the beginning, when you have the Chinese success and Russian success here su uh, supplying vaccine, um, enabling their, their partner to uh, execute uh, vaccine diplomacy and the EU uh, is stumbling out of the block. They're completely on top of everything else. And that is nowhere seen, the EU ineffectiveness than in uh, North Macedonia. So uh, this uh, gets overlooked sometimes here. We talk about Kosovo and Serbia, but uh, when you talk about the, the real proof of the EU's inability uh, to uh, abide by its own principles and, and what should be it, its own policy. This is, oh, they, wa they want to lead in this partnership, they say, uh, but they don't follow through. And when they ask a country like North Macedonia to uh, resolve its issues with its Albanians and implement the agreement, they do the Ohrid agreement, they implement it, it's done. And then they're blocked uh, by Greece. And then they do, uh, and then they go off with a uh, populist uh, for 10 years. And they come back with a, a Western-oriented leader. They enter into a good faith negotiations with Greece, the same kind that Kosovo and Serbia could do. The same kind, it's proof it can be done. And they change their name and Greece also makes concessions to their idea. And they change their name and what happens? They've fulfilled the obligation we've set out for them on the Albanians. They fulfilled the obligation we've set out with them on Greeks and Greece to its credit to them. And what, what happens, France blocks their uh, point. And the one thing where I would uh, say that uh, President Vucic was absolutely right 
was to point this out and point out this uh, as proof, which everyone knew it was of absolute abject hypocrisy. And so then, now where are they? Now we have another EU state, uh, that uh, Bulgaria, that blocks them from even uh, after France relents, has its way. There's a third new version of the EU thing. They've done you know, EU 3.0. And they, uh, what happens now? Another EU country steps in Bulgaria and says, no, uh, uh, you will uh, change your identity and your history according to the way we say it. And so, and you have a German presidency that doesn't really tackle that issue. German presidency, the most powerful country in the EU, six months, nothing done. And um, so uh, it's, uh, is this the foundation for a good partnership? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it is. Please. Well, thank you very much, Professor Joseph. One additional short question for you. Do you think that the land swap or the exchange of territories or deline delineation or whatever, how, however we call it, is the idea which is out of the agenda with the new administration? Or uh, do you think that there is still a potential for implementation of some sort of that idea, some variation of that idea as the final, relation, as the final solution for uh, the agreement between Belgrade and Pristina? Well, that's an easy one for me, uh, Milan, and I've been <laughs> very vocal about this uh, incredibly dangerous and counterproductive idea. Uh, I, I'll just say, if you, if you like Russia and you like Russian and Chinese um, influence in the Balkans, then you'll love the land swap because that's what it gives. Okay, so that's what it is. It's not resolution of anything uh, except it's resolution to give Russia and China more influence. We don't have time. I could explain that piece by piece why that's the case. Uh, it resolves nothing. It undermines the exact principle on which you can only have stability in the Balkans. Uh, so, uh, I, and I believe the Biden administration understands this. You, we should note, it, it's, I'm surprised even by the question, the Trump administration abandoned this. Grinnell was very vocal about this. So it's a very uh, unusual question for me uh, to get that after the Trump administration has abandoned this, Lychak has um, repeated it uh, constantly that it's completely contrary to European values and out of their question. And so uh, if the Trump administration abandoned, which didn't care about values, the EU Lychak uh, notes that it's contrary to EU values and stability. I see no reason why the Biden administration would turn to this and uh, they certainly shouldn't. Again, it's a gift to Russia and to China. Thank you very much for your answer. I agree with you completely. Uh, already, uh, maybe during the mandate of Mr. Bolton as a national security advisor, there were some rumors that this idea might be uh, acceptable for the United States. However, it seems that it was uh, that it was not acceptable. For example, during the 2008 to 2012, and then some somehow it became an idea which was uh, in the focus of the Serbian, at least Serbian government, Serbian side in the dialogue uh, during the Trump's administration. So uh, that reincarnation of that idea is somehow still vivid and it's still in our memory since it was only a couple of years ago. And that's the reason why I think we should uh, consider it uh, in the future as well, since I don't think that uh, Vucic and Serbian government will give up of that idea. Although they never explicitly said that it is their plan but the, President Vucic said that his plan is uh, some sort of delineation, however we call it, uh, although he never explained what does that mean uh, in, in details. But uh, thank you for, for uh, giving us your opinion about uh, this, this solution. And um, uh, since we do not have any additional questions at the moment, I would uh, kindly ask all of you to uh, give a brief answer uh, about the, your position on considering that the Serbian image in the United States is uh, still to a certain extent spoiled during the stigma which Serbia has um, because of the 1990s and that the US image in Serbia is as well to a certain extent spoiled in the public opinion considering that the majority of Serbs perceive United States as a historical enemy which is 
Well, which is basically not true, considering that only during the 1990s, Serbs and Americans were enemies. And uh, throughout the history, considering in both of the world wars, we were mostly allies, but the perception is obviously shaped mostly by the recent events. Uh, what could, uh, on the one hand, Serbia and Serbs, and on the other hand, the United States and Americans do to change uh, their images in Serbian and uh, respectively American public opinion, what would you advise the US and Serbian government to do uh, in this uh, regard? Uh, so we might begin with Mr. Bandovic, uh, since he's the last one who had the floor. Mr. Bandovic, the floor is yours, please. Um, thank you very much, Milan. This is not an easy question to answer uh, at the end of our discussion. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we have to, I mean, I was, I'm speaking on the, on the side, I mean, from the perspective of, of Serbian citizen. I think that Serbia has always been, uh, at least since 2000, uh, has been fighting for democracy. And majority of Serbian voters since the beginning of, um, democracy in Serbia have, has been voted for the EU, which is, uh, as we heard, a foundational partner of the US. So basically every time Serbia was declaratively part of that uh, world and of that values. Um, somehow uh, uh, this was manipulated and, and abused usually by uh, strongmen in Serbia, but also other, in other places in the region. We have to uh, be clear and vocal about that uh, because I think we can um, still, and we still do have a lot of um, shared uh, values uh, with the US. And on the other hand side, I think US has to appreciate uh, this, um, uh, well, in, in this case, great struggle for uh, Serbian uh, democracy. The, the, I know I'm aware that the US will, uh, and maybe probably uh, cannot lead in this uh, struggle. It can lead on, on another level, but it can help and it can uh, assist because uh, this is extremely important in this uh, crisis times. Thank you very much, Mr. Bandovic. Ambassador Manter, the floor is yours, please. Yes, quite simply, I would build on the same kind of statement I made before about the breadth of society. That is, I'll tell you what they shouldn't do is the Serbian government should not hire a PR firm in Washington, DC and come up with some clever new branding idea. This they should not do. What they should do is they should pay, play on the various and very long-term relationships that they have. There is a Serbian diaspora in the United States and elsewhere. There are Serbian businesses. There are Serbian uh, members of society who are well-known. You know, you have tennis players, you have a lot of other kinds of people. People who have a different face of Serbia that we know is an accurate one. One that's dynamic, one that's young, and one that is at least uh, in sync with a lot of Western values. That is rather than trying to work out, work on people who don't share Western values to encourage those people who do with more exchanges, which with more kinds of, of, uh, of contacts. And again, this is why I'm, uh, I'm such a big fan of the DFC. And I think Ambassador Godfrey, I think shares this idea uh, that, that getting, Getting the working level people who build societies, who invest, who are cultural and civic leaders to link, we have enormous amounts of things in common. But the time horizon for this kind of investment is many years. It's decades rather than a year. And it means that the governments of both countries would have to say, we have a commitment that we want to work on, and it's going to take a very long time. And it's going to take, in a way, it's going to be take, you know, forgetting the memory of the bombings of 1999 and getting past that and saying, we're not pretending it didn't happen, but we have other things that are more important that we need to work on. So that's, a, that's a, not a very satisfying idea because it's not something you can put in a policy paper. It's something that takes enormous commitment over a long time at a non, at, not at the top level of government. 
but at a social level. I think it's possible, and I certainly hope that at some level we continue to try to do that. Do, do you have, Ambassador Mantra, do you have any idea how long does it take? Is it like a couple of decades? What is, what is your impression about it? The question is not trying to measure when it yeah. gets there, but that the process itself changes the countries. The process changes so that in Hollywood, the bad guy is not always a Serbian guy. Yeah. you know, so that it just gets accepted over time. It's a self-fulfilling thing. So it could last a couple of years. It could last two decades. I just don't know, but the, but it's worth it to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Manther. Uh, Professor Joseph, the floor is yours. The same question. Thank you, uh, Milan. It's a great question. Uh, and I have a pretty clear answer uh, for three parts. First, I would say, just for your viewers, uh, I don't believe that Serbian image is so bad in the United States. I simply don't uh, accept that. Uh, and uh, I'll give one case in point. Uh, Tesla, which uh, Serbia celebrates as uh, its hero, obviously Croatia has a different view, but uh, uh, certainly... A, a, but they uh, are wrong. <laughs> right, exactly, okay, <laughs> whatever. But uh, Tesla is celebrated. Uh, in the United States. So, so do you have an icon, you have a Serbian icon who is a now an American icon and a tremendously successful American icon and represents all about the future in the United States. So, and people are not walking around here and saying bad things about certain so forth. This is, it's just simply not. So that's the first point is, let's have some perspective about this. Uh, the second point, if we look at this uh, about what, you, you, what should the US do, what should Serbia do? Okay. So I can, again, focus on the U.S. So if we look at what the U.S. should do with a perception of Serbs, oh, you know, NATO bombing, you're against us, and all of this stuff. So how do you, what, what is our responsibility in that? Okay, when you have a, a population that says, oh, you're against us, and uh, you're, we've been demonized, and NATO bombed us, and all this. So, well, what are the things you would do? You would do two things. You would... Um, acknowledge the pain of Serbian uh, suffering. You would acknowledge that, including from NATO bombing. And you would stand up for justice for Serbs, for, for Serb crimes, for crimes that were done against Serbs. In the world. And guess what? We've done both. And uh, we've uh, gone to such lengths to uh, address crimes that were committed against Serbs, that we took an unprecedented step that of course in Serbia was barely noticed really. We made the sitting president, elected president of our partner country of what we consider to be a sovereign state, the Republic of Kosovo. We made the president of that country, even Milosevic was not president when he went to The Hague. We made a sitting president resign and go to The Hague to answer principally, principally for crimes against Serbs, including murders against Serbs, okay? So we did that and, and, and we continue to stand for justice. Let all those who committed crimes answer for their uh, uh, crimes. So that's number one that, that we should do and we've done. Number two is we should acknowledge the suffering of the Serb people from, for example, the NATO bombing. And guess what? That was done. And guess who did it? Joe Biden did it. He didn't apologize because we have nothing to apologize because we didn't want NATO to bomb Serbia. Uh, it was, that was a decision by the Serbian government to reject uh, mediation uh, and autonomy, exactly what Serbia would prefer to have Kosovo as autonomous. Serbia rejected that. We bombed and Serbia suffered. And none other than Vice President Joe Biden came to Belgrade and acknowledged the suffering. He said he paid condolences to that. He didn't, and he didn't apologize, nor should he, and nor will we ever apologize. But he acknowledged the Serb suffering. So those are two things we should do. So, and we've done them. What's, what's the third thing that we should do in terms of today? I'll tell you, this is the key, Milan. We should show respect for the Serbian people. That's what we should do. How do you do that? You do that by supporting the Serbian people in their efforts 
to have a government that represents their views, a democratic government. You do that not by turning a blind eye to uh, all the revisions that were made, uh, all the progress that was made uh, under President Tadic and others to, to institute democracy. You don't turn a blind eye to that. You stand with the Serbian people and you say, wait a minute, it's not for us. You're not respecting your own people. Therefore, we're on the side of the Serbian people. We don't want systemic corruption. We don't want uh, uh, oppression and uh, fear in the part on journalists. We don't want a media landscape that's com completely dominated by the government. We stand with the Serbian people in their desire for democracy, not the opposite, not coddling and avoiding that topic and praising uh, a government, uh, hoping to get something out of them on Kosovo or something else. So that's, uh, and, and with respect to China, uh, we're in a bad position now because it looks like China's a winner here, but we, we have to explain the other side. China brings Serbia pollution. China brings Serbia corruption. China brings Serbia corros uh, corrosion of values. And the pandemic hopefully will not be here forever. And yes, they've done a much better job than the EU on, on vaccine, but it's not the only issue. There are other issues. And in the end, uh, what we believe certainly is that a democratic societies that are open and free and liberal do a better job of taking care of their own people and in medically and in economically and in other, and they and they do a better job of making them at peace uh, with their neighbors and so that's my answer to you if serbia wants a vision of dem democracy and uh, being at peace with its neighbors cooperate with us and we're we'll stand with you and the serbian people in achieving that vision Thank you very much, Professor Joseph. And uh, well, this is the, the great point, despite the fact that I would, I would obviously not disagree with you in all of the aspects which you said, especially regarding the responsibility from the, for the bombing, as probably 18 or 90 percent of Serbs would disagree. But I think that you have mentioned a couple of really important points. The one is that President Biden in 2016 uh, already said that uh, that he he's uh, that he expressed his regrets for the civilian victims and. Besides that, that uh, also uh, the United States should um, try to uh, to put an emphasis on their respect towards the Serbian people, and that that might be the very successful instrument for the U.S. public diplomacy. And uh, considering that, I would like to um, one to once again um, to 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 put an emphasis on the public diplomacy campaign, which was launched by the U.S. embassy in Belgrade uh, a couple of years ago, two years ago actually, I think. And the the main slogan of that campaign is "You are the world," and uh, that campaign actually is directed towards uh, somehow uh, putting an emphasis on the Serbian role or role of the most important Serbs like Tesla, which you have mentioned, or Pupin. Tesla is not was not mentioned in, the, in that campaign, but Pupin was mentioned and other important Serbs like those who participated in Apollo 7 mission and other people who contributed to not only the American history, but to the development of civilization. And uh, the United Embassy uh, actually uh, gave some sort of uh, tribute and uh, respect to them uh, through these uh, campaigns. And I think that is one of the most important public diplomacy acts which the United States Embassy did in the last couple of decades. And uh, to conclude with uh, this uh, discussion, although we had a couple of additional questions in the meantime, however, we do not have... Uh, any time left. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you have, if you as a panelist have a cu couple of minutes more for one additional round, we can do a quick round. If not, we can finish now since we are already 10 minutes. Uh, we, 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 we should have finished 10 minutes ago. So it's up to you. I'm game. Okay. All right. 
Okay, so you're in. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, let's continue with questions then. Um, yeah, but well, this question which which uh, which was asked about the Republic of Kosovo, uh, the so-called Republic of Kosovo, I think that question is already uh, answered by by Mr. Joseph. But we have an additional question uh, about how much the foreign policy shift brought about the Trump administration mind the capability of the overarching US foreign policy strategy towards the Balkans? That's the first question. And uh, the second question is, um, are you this, I think this one is for Professor Joseph, are you standing with the Serbian people on uh, chemotherapy, which they're undergoing due to the consequences of the NATO bombing? I suppose this one is uh, directed to the, um, to the, the, the use of the uranium during the bombing. Uh, the third one is Republika Srpska. I think that we already touched upon that question. Uh, the fourth one to Mr. Manter, how do you commend Serbia wanting to join the EU and still maintaining good relations with Russia? And how long do you think that Serbia can stay in that situation? Okay, so let's try to uh, somehow uh, merge all of these questions. So I would kindly ask Mr. Manter to answer this question. So how do you comment on Serbia wanting to join the EU and still uh, to maintain good relations with Russia? Do you think that's achievable? And then uh, we will go to other questions which were uh, asked, uh, which, which were directed to Professor Joseph. Mr. Manter, the floor is yours. Very, very briefly. I think the question about European uh, Union membership and relations with Russia is a question that gets back to what uh, Professor Joseph was saying about uh, reiterating that question. What does, what does Serbia want to be? Do you want to be like the other countries of the European Union with all of their faults, with all of their problems? They have relations with Russia. Portugal has relations with Russia. Italy has relations with Russia. Do you want to have them as a client state? Or do you want to have them as a member of the greatest group of democracies in Europe? It's your choice. So those countries continue to have relations with Russia. Now there is a long and historical sentimental relationship that is, you know, played up all the time in, in Serbia, which is, uh, you know, kind of the mythical brotherhood of whether it's uh, religious or other historical background, fine. But your choice is fundamentally not that you have to choose to hate Russia if you join the European Union. When you join the European Union, you're participating in a democratic organization that has relations with Russia. And you choose how you want to do that. And the model, if you want to see your future, is look at the other members of the European Union and how they deal with Russia. It's not an, it's not an either or thing, but it is an either or question about what you want to be. It's not a choice about EU and Russia, it's about yourself. Thank you very much, Ambassador Manter. And uh, the, so the last, the last question for uh, Professor Joseph, there was actually a comment of Tanya Raich uh, Blanusha. She said that, uh, well, she would politely suggest that respecting Serbs includes acknowledging that the sitting president of the so-called Republic of Kosovo was sent to The Hague because he was a war criminal and also that the so-called Republic of Kosovo should not be declared or recognized probably as a country. That's her opinion. And uh, following that opinion, there was a question about the consequences of the NATO uh, of the NATO bombing. So obviously, Professor Joseph, the wounds of uh, the of acceptance or recognition of the Kosovo's independence in Serbia by the United States and of the bombings are still quite deep. Uh, is it possible to overcome them in the forthcoming history in the next decade or two? Of course it is. Of course it is. All these issues are uh, um, able to be overcome. Uh, Montenegro bombed Dubrovnik, okay? Uh, this is the uh, absolute treasure of uh, Croatian uh, uh, patrimony in Dalmatia and a uh, world recognized, bombed it, okay? Now, you think that that would make Croatian people really, really angry to see their absolute total, uh, not only shrine, but also something that very important to their uh, uh, tourist economy. And you would think that that would linger so long with such bitterness that, uh, that they would really resent Montenegrins and who they're in competition with, and that they would have very tense relations. And one is Catholic, the other is Orthodox, and here they were bombed. What are their relations today, uh, Milan and 
questioner who, who asked and raised uh, Nato uh, on it. What, what are their uh, relations between Montenegro and Croatia after this uh, direct bombing? Excellent, excellent relations at every level, at official level, at societal level. Excellent relations. Why? Because Montenegro took responsibility for its actions. In terms of the West, what are the principles and values of the West? Not like China, not like Russia. The West takes responsibility. There are legal avenues. If there's any uh, responsibility there for NATO, I'm here, I quickly Googled, there was uh, a, here's a, uh, a report here. There was a commission about the NATO form under UN auspices to review the NATO bombing campaign against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Transparent, done, okay. Uh, if there are other avenues that need to be pursued, let them be pursued. Uh, that's Western values. Those are Western values. But Western values are not um, taking grievances and continuing to look at these grievances uh, without uh, any context. That does not lead uh, to any progress. Uh, and we don't have time to discuss it, but uh, the only point I will make about uh, Western and US policy on Kosovo and you can say, Milan, uh, I don't believe folks can disagree, not, not on this, this is a point of fact, is that the consistent position of the United States and its allies on the issue of Kosovo up to the 1999 uh, bombing was not independence for Kosovo. It was consistently against independence of Kosovo, consistently. And it was looking for every opportunity, every variation to avoid independence of Kosovo. And I think that's a fundamental point of fact that uh, people should understand that this was not some pro-Albanian thing to, to uh, separate territory from Kosovo. This was an effort, good faith effort, to resolve this issue by peaceful means through uh, mediation, through negotiation, through uh, international intervention and observation, and it was rejected. I'm sorry if people disagree for the basis of that, but I believe that those facts are clear, and that's why uh, Vice President Biden went to Belgrade and acknowledged and expressed condolences for the victims, because those are also Western values. We, we believe in that, despite they're, they're good cause, but not to apologize. And, and no such apology will, will be forthcoming. Thank you very much, Professor Joseph. I would, I would pretty much agree with you regarding the responsibility of, of the Serbian leadership in that time for avoiding the possibility to uh, find the solution before 1999. Although the, the negotiations in Rambouillet the legitimacy and legality of the use of force after them uh, are to be discussed. And I think that the use of force was eventually illegal from the point of the international law, but definitely uh, to conclude, uh, there are a couple of perspectives from which we could look on that event. And uh, besides the standard perspective, the standard lenses, which we usually have as Serbs, and that is to consider that the bombing was uh, illegitimate and Ill illegal. Uh, there is also the second perspective, which, which we should think about, and that is what is the responsibility of Serbian, of Serbian leadership. And considering that, I would like to uh, give the floor to Mr. Bandovic to make a comment on, on, the same, on these questions. Mr. Bandovic, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Milan. Uh, I, I just wanted to comment on that because um, uh, I think that um, emotional uh, reactions to the to, to Kosovo, to NATO bombing, as we are uh, now in the um, commemorating, uh, it's now 20, 22 years of NATO bombing. Is, um, it's a very interesting phenomenon in Serbia. And I see that younger gener generations are even more uh, emotionally attached to it um, than, than, than the older ones. And also, if you look in the comparison, I remember in 2001, um, in March, there was not big um, commemoration of that day. As we are progressing, um, uh, and, and, and as the years go by, we are 
more going back to commemorating and really uh, expressing our grievances, which is really strange for me. Um, uh, that's the first thing I wanted to say. Secondly, um, I think that um, somehow this is part of the same, I think, politics, which on one hand side saying the dialogue with, Serb with Kosovo is a good thing, and on the other hand side is telling us that, uh, uh, you know, the Albanians uh, are, um, uh, well, they are called by our, our officials uh, by derogatory names. Uh, I mean, by our officials, basically. And that's, that's something which uh, incites uh, uh, really strong negative opinions uh, about the party which we are about to make an agreement, to, to have a dialogue with, which tells me that there is no genuine um, uh, interest in making trust and peace between Serbs and Albanians, at least from our side. And that's problematic thing. Because I understand that ordinary citizens have emotional reactions to it. But, but if the public support, if the government is not doing anything to really to, to provide framework where, uh, the, the, uh, or, or to provide, uh, to be tolerant at least towards the others, in this case Albanians, you cannot expect that the younger generations who are watching us uh, will have any kind of different opinion than the guys who were not really guilty for the bombing, but responsible at least for the bombing. And that's, that's what's, what is worrisome in this whole thing. Because, uh, uh, because the problem is that um, uh, somehow people uh, are uh, here faced with a false dilemma. And this dilemma is forced by the government. And that is, uh, uh, we will, uh, you know, uh, we, if you give up Kosovo, then you, be, you, you will become member of the EU, which is not a dilemma at all. But it is forced upon, upon the people and people have to decide on this. And people are claiming it's better to be ourselves, to have our identity, to be proud, than really become members of the EU. But the, this dilemma, is not the real one. I remember when Serbian government in the beginning of the democratic changes and, and later on was extraditing war criminals, the, the protests against extradition were, were, were basically done in that way. They are extraditing our war heroes and they were not definitely war heroes. In order for us to become more European, in order for us to be more uh, closer to the EU. So th they are selling us basically. And this dilemma is not something that ordinary citizens would come up to. This is the dilemma which is forced upon usually nationalistic elite in this country. And it has been since Milosevic like that. Thank you very much, Mr. Bandovic. So, uh, well, uh, we are, half an hour over time, but I think that we had a fruitful discussion and an opportunity to open some additional questions which are very important and which we could discuss in the next couple of hours, obviously. Um, but I think that this, the discussion was very fruitful. And um, first of all, well, I would like to thank to the audience for the questions and for being with us here today. But I would like to especially thank to uh, distinguished panelists. It was my great pleasure to be your host today and to talk to you today. If uh, you want to have the last couple of sentences, if anyone wants, please feel free. If not, if, 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 if everything is said, then in that case, I would like to uh, thank you all one more time for today's discussion and to thank to our guests, especially uh, guests from the United States and Czech Republic, uh, Professor Joseph and Ambassador Manter. And I would like to thank to Mr. Bandovic, who is also one of the co-organizers of this um, event uh, from Belgrade Center from, uh, for Security Policy, uh, who is organized together with the Faculty of Political Science, University of Belgrade. And 
and uh, well, I hope that uh, we will have a, another fruitful discussion in the next months about the similar topic. In uh, the late April, we will have uh, 100 days of Biden's administration, so that might be a good opportunity to somehow make some sort of, uh, well, checklist of what Biden has done in this region and generally speaking in his foreign policy and uh, what were uh, his declared priorities. So stay tuned and uh, I hope that we will have the similar panel very soon. Thank you very much for, uh, for being with us today. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.